Thank you very much. Thank you very much for eMERGE, for inviting us here and letting us share our passion for the media and tech industry with you. Thank you very much to you, the audience who, who's here. Really, the conference gets better every year. Today, we're going to talk about the, um, uh, well, we know media, you know, we know people consume media in many different ways. Today, we're going to talk about how this media disruption play is, uh, is, is playing out in Latin America and the U.S. Hispanic market. We have a great panel here. Um, in fact, I'm going to let you introduce yourself briefly. Go ahead, Arumi. All right. Uh, I'm Rich Hall. Uh, I'm one of the founders of Pongolo. Uh, Pongolo is a subscription service very similar to Netflix or Hulu, but focused on uh, primarily U.S. Latinos and, to a certain extent, international Latinos. Right. And uh, you want backgrounds as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure, no, and I've been in the media business for uh, the better part of 20 or 25 years. I uh, started as a film financier and producer of more mainstream Hollywood movies. Uh, and, uh, and then about 10 years ago, I was teaching a film finance class at UCLA and getting all these questions about digital and realized I needed to get into it. And uh, so uh, today, uh, I started Pongolo with some partners about three and a half years ago. So who was here for the Pitbull uh, conference yesterday? Was someone here? I learned a new ter term, sauvecera. So here's uh, Juan <laughs> Romero, he's a native so, so, suavecera guy. Right, so the only thing I have in common with Pit Boys, we started Little Havana and ended up in La Sauvecera. <laughs> um, but uh, my name is Juan Romero, I'm, I'm from Miami, um, and I run a, a media company called, in Latin America called Metro. Um, if any of you are from New York or from Europe, the, the free newspapers that in 1995 were innovative, right? And today, you know, we're struggling for survival, right? Even a, uh, a, a free uh, publication, if it's print, is a real challenge, right? We're, we're in 10 countries, um, and everything we're doing is how to be as relevant digitally as we were in 1995 when what we were doing was different and innovative. And I'll, I'll be talking to you about that. Great. Juanjo is, uh, lives in Miami, not, a, not, not Sauvecera, but um, originally from Mexico. But go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, yeah, I was born and raised in Mexico City. Um, moved to the US about 15 years ago. And I lead the content partnerships team for YouTube in Spanish-speaking Americas. Um, and that means LATAM and the US Hispanic market. Uh, my career is being basically um, on media, traditional media, um, and digital and technology. I was, as many of you in the room, called the digital guy in my early stages. Um, and super happy to be here today with all of you. Great. So we have three panelists that have real industry that they're playing out this, um, what, what's going on in the media industry day in and day out in their daily jobs. First of all, I want to share some, some data points just to, so we're all in the same, we, have, we all have the same background. I'm looking, at, looking for the clicker. I don't know if it's there. Well, maybe they can put up, put, put up the slides in the background. Great. So just some USA data. This is just one page. Uh, turn turn the, the slide, please. Do you see a clicker? I don't know. No. Oh, where it is. No. Can you turn the slide? There we go. Is there a clicker? Sorry. Where's, oh, here it is. Perfect, perfect. Sorry about that. Oops. All right. Just some, some information on the U.S. market, just, just to get some background. It's interesting. The first slide is um, how many less minutes people were watching live TV. In Q1 of 2016, that was three minutes uh, less than the previous quarter. Then it was two minutes uh, less. I think it, what's interesting is in Q4, uh, sorry, in Q1, it was five minutes. So it seems that the trend was diminishing, but now in the last quarter was increasing again. So less uh, people watching, well, less people watching less live TV than before. Also Q1 2017, so large declines in pay TV subscribers. We talked about, or we've been reading a lot about cord cutters. Well, Q1 2017 was, was a, a bad quarter for, for cable subscribers. And SVOD, and I know Rich is going to talk more about it, about it. a lot of people well, 19% of um, like Netflix, Amazon Prime subscribers were willing to pay for three or more services. So that's some background on what's going on in the, in the U.S. Now, courtesy of, of uh, Comscore, we have some data on, 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 the, on Latin America. 
This is the audience sizes in, in Latin America and the U.S. Hispanic markets and main countries. So Argentina today, 77% of the population are on the web. In Brazil, 60%. Mexico, 54%. U.S. Hispanic, 67%. Remember that this is total population. So you have young kids that are not in the internet, although nowadays that's also changing a lot. Um, content categories, what are people consuming online? It's basically services. Portals, interesting that portals are still uh, significant in Latin America. And then entertainment is a big category. Um, in terms of video consumption in Latin America, we see that like 85, 86% in Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina, that consumption is entertainment. So, so that's very relevant, and that's a little bit what we're going to talk about here today. And obviously, you know, it, it depends on age and what we've seen here. And I have one slide for Argentina and one slide for Brazil is that people who are younger consume more video than, than people who are older. And there's no, no, no surprise there. Um, with that, I want to end sort of the data sharing. And, and just start with one question we talk about video is, how, how have you seen video consumption change in the US Hispanic and Latin American markets in the last couple of years? Um, I would say it's, it's growing dramatically. What we are experiencing and seeing in the market is um, these markets and the consumption is really engaging with what partners are putting up there um, on the distribution platforms that, as YouTube, enables them to get to these audiences. For us as a company, it's super important what we are seeing in terms of growth, specifically in Brazil and Mexico, since they are um, within the top five ranking in the most viewed territories uh, for YouTube worldwide. So um, it's super important uh, for them. The important thing about to understand how they are consuming is they are engaging uh, in niche, in very specific things. And they are consuming not only the things that are, are produced within uh, their, front, their frontiers, they are producing content all around that it's coming. Usually, the vast majority of a content consuming a country comes from another country. So that's a great example on how the content that is being consumed in the US Hispanic is being watched today. The vast majority is being coming from uh, Latin America, but the differentiator there is um, the monetization, how you're monetizing in a territory like the U.S. Hispanic. Um, I would say it's, it's um, we've been asking them like how they are consuming. When you begin to understand their habits, um, and as you were saying, younger demos, how they are consuming, when you begin to think about this binge watching phenomena, some other platforms come up to mind. Uh, but if we ask them um, on a recent study on, on millennials, almost, a third of them answer that they watch uh, and they perform binge watching on YouTube. And when we ask them, how long are those periods of binge watching? It's like more than four hours. So I think they are engaging with that content that they love. Um, and we are enabling those partners to get to those audiences that are craving for that kind of content. Great, great. So that's really interesting that you said Mexico and Brazil are your top five markets globally. Are within the top five ranking. Globally, but, yeah. Um, I think another interesting thing you said, and I think it points to the opportunities, because sometimes we focus a lot on the threats of digital, but you mentioned opportunities that your content that you were producing in one country can now be seen with Correctly, from, yeah. from many other countries. And that's the way I, you get to see the content really does not understand anything about borders or, or, or blocks. It goes, uh, for us, a great example is Germán, is the largest Spanish speaking uh, creator. And the guy is Chilean, he's based in Mexico, he lived a lot of years in LA, um, and he appeals to a global mass, a global audience, um, and he's the largest subscribe-based uh, um, creator in the world, um, Spanish-speaking uh, speaking, uh, uh, subscribers. So his content goes around the world, regardless where he's based and where he was born. Great, great. Rich, you, you have an interesting background both in, with traditional film production and, and TV production, and now you're launching your, your OTT. How have you seen the, the, the environment changing in the last couple of years in the U.S. expanding market? Uh, a lot. So I, I think it's probably the biggest change from traditional media to digital media that we'll ever see in our lifetime. It's happening right before our eyes, right? I have friends from all the studios and the networks, people that I came up through the ranks with that I have lunch with and they are all pulling their hair out going, I'm not sure I'm gonna have a job tomorrow and I love what you're doing. So suddenly we're in the sexy part of the business which is the digital side. 
But what I see happening is actually kind of like history repeating itself um, because I can see this from, you know, being an old guy coming from traditional media. But uh, in the early day, think about like the early days of cable television, right? There were three major players. There was ABC, CBS, and NBC, and they were kind of all things to all people. And then suddenly cable TV came in, and there were all these very audience-specific players. There was the cooking channel, and there was Lifetime for Women, and there was ESPN for Sports, and so on. And suddenly those became incredibly valuable brands. I see the same thing happening in digital today. There's three major players. There's Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. They're kind of all things to all people. And I'm starting to see this fragmentation of audience-specific OTT platforms over the top, meaning they don't go through your cable box. Um, and they're subscription services. So there's something for Latinos, and there's something for African Americans, and there's something for uh, gay populations, and there's something kind of for everybody. And it's starting to look very similar to the early days of cable TV, where you see these fragmented audiences. And to Juan Ho's point, that's the great thing about digital, is it allows you to focus on and find niche audiences which, uh, which traditionally didn't make sense economically in the early days, or in any days of cable television, for instance. You know, and, and, and I think of us focusing on the Latino market as focusing on a niche. It happens to probably be the biggest niche in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's what's exciting to me. That's what gets me up every morning is, the, is, is that trying to solve ways and create strategies to go after those very specific audiences that we just never did in traditional media, which was just about kind of being all things for all people. No, that's great. Do you think the fact that you know, now it's an on-demand service, that that may change how history plays itself, as you said. Because yeah, well, with ABC, I, you had to watch what was on. You did. You had a bunch of white guys sitting in a room mm -hmm. somewhere programming and hoping that you tuned in. And I think we don't have to do that anymore. I think we can have a lot more respect for our audience and give them the choice. So for me, I never, I feel like that we curate, but we don't program um, because we're giving the audience a lot of choices and letting them make that choice. I mean, audiences demand on demand. I don't think that's any secret. Um, but I think it's probably the most important change that, that we're seeing in media today. Like we've gone from an access, a, a culture of, of ownership to a culture of access. Like right? when I was a kid, I, I wanted to own my favorite music and my favorite movies on, I'm embarrassed to say VHS, but I would probably lie and say DVD. Um, because I wanted to see them on the shelf and touch them and own them and pull them down and play with them. Mm -hmm. Like when was the last time you bought a DVD? You know, it's access now. I want all my content, whatever it is, any device, anytime, anywhere. I would say that the, the on-demand is one portion, and for us, the other um, that really ignited is the evolution of mobile devices. It's the ability that what you were saying, Rich, you can access that content anywhere in the world, whatever you are, at any time. So it's the two things is, is the balance that has really revolutionized the state of the media right now. Yeah. Right. That's a good segue. I mean, I, I'm glad Juan is here. We talked a lot about video, but print is an interesting medium. And Juan said, everyone has a phone in the hand. You don't see everyone with a like, newspaper in the hand as maybe some years before. Um, what's your perspective? How is that yeah, how is digital being well, played out for you? Well, I mean, let me just start. Uh, mo mostly, unless you live in Latin America or, or Europe, you're probably not familiar with Metro. Um, in 1995, a Swedish company called Kinevik um, started the first free newspaper. What was innovative about it is that you could get information and entertainment in 15 minutes on your way to work uh, in the subway. Um, and then over the course of the last 15 years, these metros started to be born uh, across Latin America, some distributed in buses and subways or at traffic lights, right? And over the last 15 years, it's the, the way we reach our audience has been very different because the way we connected with our audience, first of all, we, we, we knew that they didn't have time, so that was innovative in 1995, right? And today everyone is sort of freaked out if they have 10 or 15 minutes to check their Facebook site or YouTube or they read a newspaper or digital subscription, you know, that's too much. And so we've had to ask ourselves, all right, um, we, we're, we want to focus on uh, a quick read. Distributing through paper on the way to work is only one way now, and if that's the only thing we focus on, we're not going to exist. Um, so how do we connect with, with, with our audience? 
So we've had to go digital. Uh, every day across the 10 countries, we reach 5 million people, but digitally, we reach 30 million. So us being on their smartphones on their way to work, um, that's the way we've had to reconnect. So we, we are sort of trying to maintain our business in digital, but at the end of the day, I mean, you just, you can't fight it. If people want the content on Facebook, on YouTube, um, in a certain way, Snapchat, whatever it is, you have to be there, right? So, um, you know, you hear these subscription newspaper companies who are in denial, very few of them are still in denial, is, you know, focus on your audience. Where do they want to be? How do they want the information or the entertainment? And you'll be relevant. If you're in a medium that is no longer relevant, then you're going to die when that audience dies. So you, you got to shift with it. There's just no way to fight it. But I think that's the shift today, right? Which is, uh, which is not trying. Like, like, traditionally, the media business has been about scarcity, right? So think of it as from a movie standpoint, right? You can only see a movie in a theater, and that's the only place you can see it. And then there's another window where you can only see it on TV. That's the only place you can see it, right? So it was built around scarcity. Today, the audiences demand it. They demand their content. And if you don't give it to them, they're going to figure out how to get it. So you got to kind of lean into it and say, okay, let's not worry so, about scarcity anymore. Let's worry about how do we actually give them what they want and give them that choice. But I think it's super important uh, from a traditional media standpoint um, to help publishers understand how they program for those audiences. Because that scarcity can, can still live in both worlds. Um, and how can a traditional media company like your company, one, can really go ahead and, as you were saying, program for a different audience that may be uh, in Snapchat? How you get to them through a different media, how do you understand is the, the difference. If you go and try to put the exact same content, it's going to be tough for both, for the content owner, for the platform to get a deal done, and then for the audience as well. Um, I think as, as long as we understand how to reach those audiences that are different in each, uh, in each uh, platform is how you are became, became, becoming more successful. No, great point. And well, we talked a little bit about uh, sort of a consumer behavior, how they're shifting to, to watching consuming media in different platforms. In Latin America and the US Hispanic, how is that affecting revenues? So for example, Juan, in your business, how, how has revenues been affected? This <coughs> shift? Well, well, we've never had subscription revenue, right? So <coughs> our competition, the, you know, the paid dailies, whether it's El Mercurio, El Universal in Mexico, um, you, they've, and this is the same with the exception of digital subscriptions, have been declining o over the last 10 years. We live off advertising revenue. Our print advertising revenue has been flat for two years, which is great performance in the print category, sad to say. And where we're focused is on digital uh, revenue, whether it's partnerships, brand advertising. That part's growing 50% a year. And three years ago, it was 5% of our business. Today, it's 20%. Um, so I, overall, we're doing OK. But it's about that shift and how eventually the old uh, model, whether it's pay TV, whether it's you know, print advertising, whatever the old model is, it will go away. So how do you reinvent yourself and how do you do that profitably? That's what we're focused on, right? Right. Juanjo, I, th I think there's no secret that YouTube definitely is well, one, one, it's going after you know, TV advertising budgets. Uh, more so maybe in the US and in Latin America, but can you tell us something about what's going on with, in, in Latin America? Yeah, in terms of revenue, um, what we are experiencing in the market is a growth of double digits for our partners. They are continuously growing. We know that our partners, um, um, by enabling them on the distribution form that we represent, they are getting access to new audiences. So usually a lot of their um, content is majorly being seen in their countries like Mexico, Brazil, um, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, Peru, etc. Uh, but then some of that content, the beauty is that it's also being seen on more mature markets like US or Spain. And that content is being monetized on a higher rate and a better rate. Um, so we are focusing a lot on that to help that uh, ramping curve that we are seeing until those markets evolve to the stage that we are uh, currently seeing. Um, I think that's our main focus right now, and that's what we are really trying to make these partners understand. Um, and a lot of them are very, very happy, because once you understand that 
the, those borders, they don't exist, and your audiences are wherever in the world, um, you understand that you have an opportunity to develop an extra audience and then um, a revenue. We had a case uh, that uh, from a partner, uh, a Hispanic partner, that we began to see some of their content being um, consumed dramatically in, in Italy, another one in um, uh, Saudi Arabia. And when we pinpoint them, and that's the beauty about going digitally into the tools that YouTube can offer this, um, this content owners, we found that there was some cultural correlation with that specific content, and it was becoming, uh, I would say, very popular, not viral, but very popular, and they were able to program for those audiences, even though there were not even Spanish-speaking audiences. Mm. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm. That, so you talked a little bit more about advertising revenues, but I know you launched a service, YouTube launched a service uh, on a subscription basis, just like Rich has. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, it's, it's, it's a different model. It's called YouTube TV. It's um, traditional YouTube, um, and it's uh, uh, consumed via subscription on your mobile, and then you can Chromecast that to your TV. It's currently being launched only in the US, uh, and we are super, super happy um, with, with the launch, and we're focusing on fine-tuning the app before we go into some other markets. Obviously, um, uh, as I said, in terms of territories that are very important for us, Latin America is super important. Uh, but for the time being, right now, we're focused on making it um, the biggest, the biggest uh, uh, heat that we want it to be. It's, it's coming out beautifully out of the box. So um, we don't have it yet launched in, in Miami, uh, but we have it launched in several demos around the US. So if you have access to that, I encourage you to uh, subscribe, take a trial, and I'll guarantee you, you'll love it. Right. And this is a good segue for you, subscription revenue. Is that happening in the US? US Hispanics are opening up the wallets and paying for subscription? Oh yeah, I mean, you, you, the, here's the great thing about US Hispanics. They, they over-index for having mobile devices, uh, more so than general populations. They over-consume entertainment. Uh, they make up a huge portion of opening weekends for movies. Um, they have money and they'll spend it. Right? You just have to give them a reason. And so uh, for us, we've tried to give them that reason. So Pongolo is uh, all of, we, we started with what we thought was kind of low-hanging fruit, which is, which is movies and TV shows from Latin America and bringing them up here to the US. We've more recently added US studio content mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and the price point is you know, five ninety nine is roughly half the price of Netflix. So if you, if you make it attractive for them, um, they'll absolutely spend money. And uh, and there's a there, there's there's you know, a large majority uh, majority of them have good payment solutions up here as well, which is a little bit more of an issue in Latin America yeah. than it is up here. But good credit cards and good access to Apple Pay and Google Pay and uh, and some of those those as well. So w we've found it to be a huge opportunity, a really interesting opportunity. And I think the, the next big opportunity is when traditional media and digital media start to kind of merge together, right? And I think that, uh, I think people will, as someone who knows who it will be, um, but I got some ideas, is gonna probably go out and start aggregating some of the digital subscription players. So you'll have an aggregator of aggregators. And then I think some of the traditional media guys are gonna to start to figure out how their business interacts in digital and go on an acquisition spree and kind of bring some of those in. Because it's hard, if you're a big traditional media company, it's hard to disrupt. You're not built to be innovative. Yeah. You're, you're, you're built to sort of protect your legacy business model and do it well, and they do. So it's better for you to kind of let the disruptors bubble up from, you know, from a garage band into something that is a little bit more um, pervasive and then swoop in, grab them, acquire them and integrate them into your legacy business, that's, that's gonna be really exciting. And so I think the subscription model fits in very well with that integration with traditional media. Right, um, now I'm gonna, be, before we open up for questions, I wanna let, obviously we never, we don't know about the future, but we actually, each of us in our companies, we, we make bets on what the future looks like because we gotta take actions and plan for the future. So I'll just take it in any order if anyone wants to say what you guys, how you guys see the future, what you guys are doing towards that future so, so uh, in order to grow your companies. And you guys go first. Um, so so we'll, we're, we're a substantially smaller company than these big guys up here. Um, and uh, for now, so, so yeah, one, one day I hope to be uh, uh, Juanjo's company. Reach. 
We, um, we are partners. We, we are partners, <laughs> and so uh, and 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 a great partnership, and uh, and have found YouTube to be incredibly complementary to so many things that we do as well, and them to be very supportive of us, and vice versa. Um, but um, uh, the, the, so, so the future. So for us, it's about access to capital, um, which means you know, unlike. YouTube, we have to go every time we come up with one of these bets that we want to make about what the future looks like, we have to go out and raise a new round of financing for that. So that access to institutional growth capital is, is really important. And so I see a lot more of that in the future coming into the digital media space. So where I live in LA, there's a, a, an OTT player on every corner, <laughs> and, um, which I think is great, right? Because I, in fact, once every six weeks, I go to this like group of like OTT players who all get together in someone's conference room, and we like share information and trade stories. And uh, and being part of that ecosystem is 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 great because there's a lot of infrastructure there. So I think I see more capital coming into the space uh, in the digital media space. I think that's going to cause a whole bunch of interesting disruptors to bubble up, and then some of the bigger media companies I think are going to take notice and start to gobble those up as well. So. I think there's going to be a lot of M&A action. That would be my bet for the future. Right. right. Now, in, in terms of what, what our strategies and what we're trying to do, I mean, today we reach 5 million people a day, print, 30 million uh, monthly uniques. And for us to get to where we need to get, we need to get to about 100, 150 million person audience. Um, and it's exactly what, what, what Rich was saying. We, we have a capability of a certain degree of innovation and growth organically internally. So for our goal, which is 100 million, 100, 150 million audience, we think we can reach half of that internally. Um, so, you know, you have your experiments. Uh, we represent IGN in Spanish Latin America now. We launched a new product called Nueva Mujer. Um, we've done content partnerships uh, with, with digital video producers like these guys. And we're starting to get traction. But if you want to do it faster, then you also need to turn, you know, get your checkbook out and buy some innovative companies. You know, we bought a, a Chilean content company that its content didn't know borders or all across the region, um, and we need to continue to do that, right? So I think it's always a balance, at least if you're a, you're a legacy business and that you're trying to change that model. If you try to do it all in-house, you're either not going to see opportunities or it's going to take too long. So you need to balance that with internal innovation and M&A driven innovation, and that's what we're trying to do. For us, I think um, everything is about enabling any and everybody to have a voice um, on a global basis. Um, and this can be from a viewer's perspective, or this can be from the content creator perspective. So this is the most important part of us, but there's also business behind it, right? So we need to make sure that we are um, we continue to be that place that is very attractive for the content owners to distribute that content. So in terms of what we think that is going to happen, I think um, the, the content consumption is going to continue to grow dramatically over the years. Um, it's going to continue to go and focus on very specific niches. Um, traditional media is going to continue to be there. Uh, the way the way consumers are going to be engaging, it's going to be more selective, though. Um, so media and, and some of the traditional ways we consume right now is not gone in a way, but it's going to begin to uh, experience a change in how you react to those audiences. Um, and at the end of the day, the other piece that is super important for us is how those markets that are uh, really becoming um, more mature are going to evolve. And we think Latin America is uh, really on the verge of becoming that um, really mature market where it's going to be really attractive for content owners and some other content, uh, uh, companies that really invest and go there and play um, the way we are doing some other mature markets. I want to pick up on what Juanjo said because I think it's really important, that idea of giving people a voice. Right? So on the one hand, they're consuming content. On the other hand, you're giving them a voice to create the content. Right? It's, like, uh, it's almost like we've become the entertainment ourselves right? by giving people a voice to create content. That's the thing that gets me excited about the opportunity in US Hispanic, is that traditionally, I, I mean, I grew up in Texas, so Hispanic media has just always been a part of my world. I haven't really seen them have a voice to a certain extent um, because there's traditionally been two major media players, which are the two big TV channels, Univision and, and Telemundo. 
Um, and, and I look around and I see a population that has a ton of mobile devices, but not that many digital media options. And I think that's an underserved audience. I feel like Latinos deserve better. And so that's what gets me excited is giving them that voice. Yeah, and the beauty of that is that these big players are really understanding what's going on and are, um, as I was saying, that traditional content, um, you got to understand the budgets are still there. So you need to maintain that, right? Uh, but on the other side, something is going on on this side, and these big partners um, are doing amazing thing on, on, on the media, not only with us as partners, but in the media in general. And sometimes it does not look the same way as traditional media, uh, but that's the way YouTube looks, right? We have three billion channels that not really look like traditional media, but they are speaking to very specific audiences, and everybody has a voice, and everybody is engaging to something that it's really calling to the bottom of their hearts. Great. You mentioned, uh, I'm gonna ask you something, because both of you mentioned something I think interesting. You mentioned a lot of m a You mentioned that you yourself think about growing and getting there to 150 million unique through m a Do you, Juanjo, do you see, because I know you talk to a lot of traditional players that are sort of on the digital side, do you see a lot of them going in, doing acquisitions around content? Um, yeah, what we are seeing is um, just what uh, um, a similar case f uh, of what Richard was saying about how these traditional media companies are getting into the market. So um, I think the first iteration of that was trying to create content with whatever they, they had uh, at hand. Uh, what we are seeing now is that investment specifically in Latin America to going out there and buy some, some, some partners that are uh, endemic to the platform. A great example is Viacom that recently bought Porta dos Fundos in, in Brazil. Um, they bought as well Telefe, but on the other hand, it's not traditional media. It's completely endemic, um, uh, born and raised in YouTube. So it's, for us, it's super interesting how they are, they are looking at it, because it's, it's not just a matter of buying them and then shutting them down or, or, or stealing all, all the secrets. They are really engaging, really um, reaching out and really trying to understand what's going on and really um, giving these creators that are currently doing a, a great job um, better support, because that's really what they can, access to better equipment, better uh, uh, filming facilities, and then in some cases, like with Porta, maybe um, uh, distribution to some other territories that they may not be before uh, if a company like Viacom was not uh, engaging with them. Um, same thing happened in, in the U.S. Hispanic market. So I think, yes, that'll, that'll be a case where you'll continue to see. And then on the other side, you'll, you'll see um, endemic companies beginning to behave uh, more traditionally and, and getting into traditional media. You have the case of, of Chumel Torres in, in Mexico, um, which is like the Mexican Steve Colbert, um, going into HBO and talking to a traditional, now traditional, and in the past what was that uh, disruptor, uh, but a traditional audience. So I think those jumps between, between these medias are going to continue to happen, um, but uh, I think the pace is going to be uh, faster in Latin America overall. Right. No, I think that's good news for this audience. I know there are a lot of entrepreneurs uh, here in the conference, and I think this is um, very interesting for them to hear this. Uh, we have actually less, like one or two minutes left. Um, any questions for our panel? Let's see one over there. Yes? Please state your name and, and the question. I would say content creators Can create... Can we uh, repeat the question? Uh, I'm sorry. So the, the question is, he's a, a content creator with an emphasis in 3D, uh, and do we have any advice for uh, what he can be doing to grow his career? And, and I would say content creators create, right? Directors direct, writers write, actors act. And that, believe it or not, that sounds simple, but it's actually very hard to do. A lot of people just... And he's shrinking. Uh, <laughs> and so many people talk about doing it, but then actually never get around to doing it. That's the great thing about Wanho's platform is he's, got, he's given you all the tools to create cool 3D content. You just got to go do it, and then he'll bring some eyeballs to it. And now you've got better calling cards. You've got fans. Pretty soon, traditional media will even be coming to you. 
Um, so I would say get out and roll up your sleeves and get to work. No, and experiment with uh, traditional media companies. We have 3D creators in Chile and Mexico that have approached us uh, to work together, whether to do news in a different way or to, to do things for advertisers. So pilot, beta test um, with the digital media companies or the traditional media companies, and you're going to learn faster, and you might even get some monetization out of that. And on our case, I would say creators is... is really the basement and the foundation of our platform. We love creators and uh, not only the big ones, and we are very interested in growing the ones that are upcoming creators. So if I can tell you a piece of advice is go and understand how the platform works. And in our case, um, there's a great link on YouTube Creators Hub where really we put out a lot of research. We invest a lot of time understanding how people that are really very knowledgeable on the platform are doing things like smaller things that really help to develop your content um, and then just go and educate yourself. And the, the other one is um, try to tag along with somebody, do collaborations. People are really eager to, to get people on board and even people that are already big, um, if you show up and tell them, yeah, I'm a 3D uh, uh, animator, uh, it'll be something super interesting for them and they'll, they'll give you a, a voice and they'll share a piece of their audience with you. Thank you. We've been, we, we, we've been told our time has run out, but let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>